salvation you broke the curse for our freedom oh, Jesus you Good morning, church. Excited to see some of you here this morning, and I know others will be joining us. I know there are those of you joining us online this morning. I want to say welcome to you, and uh, excited that you're here, and thank you for, for being in here to, to join us this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, first of all, I want to just say a uh, special welcome to visitors that may be with us this morning. Uh, if you will, on the screen there, notice the we have a, it's, we've changed up our contact. We used to text welcome to a, ner a number, but we're consolidating between our traditional service and Ignite service now. So uh, 
If you are a guest with us, uh, please text uh, SSFUMC to the number 22828, and that will get you on our, our list for, for information, and we want to keep you informed of what all is happening and, and invite you to be a part of, of everything going on here at First United Methodist Church. Uh, I also, in regards to that, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone that uh, went out and helped participate in Be the Service yesterday, and I know many of you all supported us uh, by buying $10 tickets, um, but we, we served, um, it was over 800 families yesterday that came through and received um, all, the, all the fixings that they could, they could need for, for a Thanksgiving dinner, and uh, it was just a wonderful time to see all of the churches in our community come together, work together, and, and it was really uh, an amazing sight, and just, just hopes and prayers that all those served uh, felt the blessing um, for sure as well. So... Uh, that said, I know that uh, Pastor Ed <clears throat> has a special announcement that he wants to, to make. Sure, thank you. So I think um, many of you, if not most of you, uh, know that several weeks ago, Emily Schindel stepped down from being our children's director, and we um, made mention of that then and, and celebrated her ministry, but uh, we wanted to really take time this morning to do that again. Uh, after having given birth to Elizabeth, she has been away from us for a while, and now she's able to return to worship with us. And um, we just want to say how appreciative we are to give thanks to God for the ministry that Emily provided and the care and the love that she gave to our children. And so I'm, I'm not sure it, I don't have my glasses on, so I'm not sure if she's... If she, not here yet. Okay. Well, when you see her, that, because we have a special gift to give her a presentation, just please be sure to tell her how much you appreciate uh, what she uh, did for our children and uh, her continued witness of faith in our church. And we're thankful. Amen? We're thankful. Yeah, hey, that, that'll work. So I also have one more uh, announcement. And as uh, United Methodist in the North Texas Annual Conference. We are under the pastoral or Episcopal leadership of Bishop Michael McKee. And so each pastor in our conference was instructed to read a letter from Bishop McKee uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, this letter is dated November the 18th. And so let me, let me read uh, Bishop McKee's letter. To United Methodist of the North Texas Conference, the ongoing crisis of the COVID-19 virus has brought pleas from public health officials to our community. In a recent meeting, faith leaders were asked to warn our congregations of a possible spike in the number of cases in the coming days. They have discovered that the increase in cases we are seeing comes from social gatherings where people feel safer and do not heed the healthcare community's warnings to wear masks and practice social distancing, especially during family gatherings and large social events. Currently, more positive COVID-19 cases are being reported than at any other time since the pandemic first began. This is true nationally in Texas and in all counties across North Texas, regardless of size. We do, however, have the ability to contain the spread of the virus by wearing masks, washing hands, and maintaining the proper social distancing. I ask that you please heed the advice of and defer to the recommendations of public officials and health practitioners who are the most knowledgeable about this virus so that our communities can remain or can return to a place of good health. For the time being, we will continue to have churches open for in-person worship, provided that all attendees strictly follow proper protocols. As, vital, as a, vi a vital part of this is wearing masks during all phases of the church's worship service, from before you walk into the building and including your time in the pews. There are pastors who, knowing the context of caseloads in the church's community, may choose to suspend public worship for a season, and I would support your pastor in making such decisions. Please know, however, there may be a time when all in-person worship 
will be suspended. As people of faith, we place a considerably high value on how we live together in community. This is a critical tenet of who we are as United Methodists. We must realize how our actions can affect our church community and the broader communities in which we live. We must act in ways that show our love for one another and lift each other up. Specifically, we must not do anything that could conceivably harm others intentionally or otherwise. We will wear masks. We will practice social distancing. We will do no harm. For more than eight months, we've been challenged in ways that many of us could never have imagined. Thank you for your perseverance and faithful witness, which has made us stronger, a stronger church. May you have a blessed Thanksgiving peace, Michael McKee. Let's pray. Our Father, we gather in this place to worship you. And you are holy and you are worthy, worthy of our worship. And so, Lord, gather our hearts and our thoughts and our minds and bring them to you. Prepare our hearts this day. Work your work of grace in us. Help us to hear your word of grace and truth. We praise you. We love you. But you loved us first. And we know that. And we worship you. And we worship you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
pray together. Gracious God, thank you for this day and for all that you give us. We gather in this place week after week to proclaim your, your goodness, to lift you, exalt you, to hear your word of grace and truth. You are holy and you are worthy, worthy, worthy of our worship. Forgive us when we fail. In word and deed, by omission and commission, we've all fallen short. We, we desperately need your grace and mercy. We are poor in spirit and we depend on you. Forgive us, we pray. We choose this day to turn away from our sin, to, to turn back to you. We receive your forgiveness. Lord, we give you thanks for all that you give us. We, we lift up our community and those who are ill. We pray healing for them. We pray for those who are wandering. and We pray direction for them for those living in a season of confusion, we pray clarity for them. Lord, we entrust them to you. We entrust our own lives to you. Lord, we choose to trust you today. We choose to trust you today. Thank you for loving us. And we offer our hearts and our minds. We give all of us join our voices and we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught so long ago praying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing this out this morning. For we trust in our God. against us on all sides, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken. Shit. 
those against him will fall for I got a stronger who can do all things no higher name we can call for Jesus is greater we can do all things all those against him If there are children who desire to go to children's church, you may meet Miss Jane at the back door at, at, uh, at this time. Also, uh, Jason, if you will come up. Actually, you've already got it. So um, we just wanted to present this to uh, Emily again. Um, just to say thanks, we, I, I said much more about that earlier in the service, but, but thank you for, uh, for your ministry. Right here, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to continue our series this morning through the Beatitudes. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We will read verses 1. Uh, let's read verses 1 through 12. And then I'll come back and pick up on our, our focused verse this morning. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds... He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, the poor, uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray once more with me? Lord, we uh, open our hearts and our minds to your word of grace and truth you know everything about us you know us better than we know ourselves gracious god help me to say what you want me to say and say it in a manner that is
helpful to your people, a manner that's glorifying to you. So we entrust this to you as we entrust everything to you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Few words in the Bible are misunderstood more than the word meek. Really, I I think probably few words in the Bible are misunderstood more than the word meek. We often don't know what it means. We don't know what it it looks like when it's lived out in the real world. And, And because of that, we just kind of shun the word altogether at times. And yet Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I mean, even if I don't know what that word means, just from Jesus' words, I know it's got to be good. Right? It's got to be good. And so this morning, that's our focus this morning. Blessed are the meek to try to dig down and, and figure out what, what that means when Jesus says, blessed are the meek. Let, let's start this week as we've been doing each week with the words in the text. We'll start with the word blessed. It happens every week. Each of these Beatitudes start with that. And so the word blessed is sometimes translated or rendered happy. Um, but the, the English word happy just does not do justice to this word. It can mean blessed, but, but the English word blessed usually sort of implies upbeat attitude or pleasant circumstances. Blessed is way more than that. Blessed is a much larger understanding. Blessed is about God's favor. It involves salvation, forgiveness, participating in the work of God, the work of the kingdom. Each week I've I've referenced uh, the Virgin Mary, Jesus' mother. Let me do that again. She is called blessed in the scriptures. And no doubt there were times that Mary was happy, but there were also times she was deeply grieved and wounded, but she was always blessed. God's favor was always on her. And she participated in the, in the work of the kingdom. And that, so that's what blessed means. The next word specific to this verse is the word meek. And my favorite definition of meek is, is power under control. Power under control. So the word meek means humble, gentle, lowly. It, it, the, the word meek just implies, denotes, if you will... The absence of retaliation. Uh, meekness does not push itself over on other people. That's what, that's what meekness is about. It's, a, it's an attitude, as one writer says, towards self, but also an expression towards others. So it's an attitude toward oneself, but it's an expression towards others. Uh, beca- because it means humble and lowly and gentle, Uh, We sometimes misunderstand what it means. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones has a great way of helping us to understand what meek is not. So first of all, meek is not a natural uh, quality, but rather a supernatural quality. I don't have the power in and of myself to make myself meek. That's that's God's uh, work in my life. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Meek does not mean nice. Uh, Nice is an attractive thing, to be sure. How many of you like nice people rather than rude people, right? Okay, that's an attractive thing, but that's not really meek. That's not meek. And meek is not weak. And I think this may be the, the biggest misunderstanding of the word meek, is that we have a tendency to think that meekness equals weakness, and it doesn't at all. William Barclay and others, they really hone in on the, an ancient Greek use of this word meek. It was used to refer to the taming or the domestication of wild animals. You, you have this powerful, strong animal, and it is brought under control. Power under control. John Wesley says it like this, and you're not going to see this on the screen, but let me share this statement from John Wesley. He says, meekness does not destroy, but balances affections or emotions, which God never designed should be rooted out by grace. In other words, God gives us emotions and affections. 
he gives us these, and, and, and some of these God never designed to be rooted out, but only brought and kept under due regulations. Meekness poises the mind aright. It holds an even scale with regard to anger, sorrow, and fear, reserving the mean or the balance in every circumstance of life, not declining either to the right or to the left. It's about power under control. I think every one of us know how rotten, utterly rotten it feels when our anger, our emotions just get out of control. Right? Ever been there? <laughs> Most of us have, right? We know what it feels like when we get so ratcheted up that we kind of lose control. Meekness is about the grace of God bringing this, this powerful emotion under control. And that makes total sense because Jesus is called meek in the scriptures. Did you know that? Jesus is called meek. He actually refers to himself as meek, and he is described as meek as well. Jesus was meek, but he most certainly was not weak by no stretch. I mean, Jesus is the one who healed the sick and the, the, the lame. Jesus is the one who cast out demons. He's the one who confronted the hypocrites. He's the one who drove the money changers out of the temple. He was meek, but he wasn't weak. He was, it, was, it was power at the right time, in the right way, every time. Meekness. Uh, Jesus was meek. And even though the listeners, and by listeners I mean the disciples and the crowd that was gathered... Even though they saw Jesus do amazingly powerful things. Remember, remember the context. There are crowds of people around Jesus because he's healing everybody and casting out demons and uh, uh, bringing people to, to restored health. Even though they've seen him do amazing, powerful things, they still do not understand. Undoubtedly, they do not understand when he's talking about meekness. Because they were looking for a Messiah that had a different kind of power. We, we know this. A, 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 a Messiah that had the power of military conquest. A, a, a Messiah who could push the, the Romans out of the way. Every one of his listeners, no doubt about it, every one of his listeners understood what it meant to be pushed around by Rome. They'd been living under the oppression of Rome for so long... Every day they were reminded that they were living under the tyranny of someone else. There's this scene in Matthew chapter 27. You, you remember this. Jesus is carrying his cross to the place of crucifixion. And a Roman soldier literally grabs a man out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, and forces him to carry the cross. I mean, to me that's just a, a singular uh, picture, just a glimpse of the, the larger reality that they lived with. They understood what it meant to be pushed around. And so when Jesus starts talking about blessed are the meek, uh, surely it just, it just goes all over them. They, they can't fully grasp it, and neither do we. I mean, neither do we. I mean, let's be honest. We, we love to support and affirm the, the outspoken, the verbose, the loud, the aggressive, the assertive, whether it's an individual or a group or a party or whatever. We, I mean, we, we are drawn to that. We're drawn to it. And it's also hard for us to remain meek when we feel that others have mistreated us. When others have mistreated us. John Stott, the great Anglican theologian and, and priest, talks about the importance of this beatitude in the larger context of the Beatitudes. Think of it this way. So the first two Beatitudes really have to do with our engagement with God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's about recognizing I have no innate goodness in and of myself that earns me the kingdom of God. I am utterly and completely dependent on the grace and mercy of God. The second one, blessed are those who mourn. And if you remember from last week, that is specifically about those mourning over sin and brokenness. It's not about mourning over heartbreak and death. Those, those have their places for sure. The Bible says a lot about the comfort that comes to that. But that particular verse is about 
mourning over our brokenness of sin and God bringing comfort to us. So the first two Beatitudes have to do with our engagement, our interaction with God. But this one very specifically also expands to how we interact with other human beings. John Stott says this. He says, I have no problem whatsoever sitting in church and making the general confession of the church. He's an Anglican, so it's the general confession, I suspect, of, of, of the Anglican church. And, and that is that I'm a miserable sinner. Stott says, I don't have a problem with that at all. I can say that and take it in stride. But if somebody comes up to me after church and tells me I'm a miserable sinner, I want to punch him in the nose. He goes on to say, and I love this statement, in other words, and this is a great statement, in other words, I am not prepared to allow other people to think or speak of me what I have just knowledge before God that I am. There is a basic hypocrisy here. There always is when meekness is absent, end quote. We say, yeah, but nobody should say anything like that to somebody else. True. But someone else's statement should never control how I respond to it. Meekness. Power under control. Number three. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Inherit the earth. So this actually comes from, before I share the verse, it comes from Psalm 37. Uh, let me give you the context of Psalm 37 because I think it brings this whole idea of meekness even more into focus. Psalm 37 begins this way. Fret not for yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Verse 9 says, For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And now comes verse 11, which is, Almost a quote, uh, uh, Jesus almost quotes this verbatim. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Jesus speaks about the blessedness that comes from meekness because there is an inheritance to it. And, and this, this really sort of blows our mind because at least in my mind, and I think I'm not alone, in the real world, like the, the world that you and I live in, meekness and prosperity and pros and success they almost seem mutually exclusive because who are the ones who get ahead the ones who get ahead are the loud ones right and i'm being loud right now so forgive me but the ones who get ahead they're the ones who push others aside the ones who get ahead they're the ones who trample on other people i mean this idea of there is a blessedness that comes from meekness it almost seems mutually exclusive, and yet Jesus says they are the ones who inherit the earth. Inherit the earth. This inheritance that, that, that the children of God have is future and present. There's a future reality here. In Romans 8, we are called children of God, and we are heirs with Christ. Think about that for a moment. If you are in Christ, you are an heir of the kingdom of God. In 2 Timothy, Paul says to Timothy that we will reign with Christ. And don't you love this statement from Revelation 21, 7? At the end of time, John sees this. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Gina Prickett's mom, Jeanette, used to have a title company. She also worked with oil and gas companies, and Gina said that in her mom's office was this little, little sign, and it said, the meek shall inherit the earth, but not the mineral rights. <laughs> Maybe that's true in this world, but in the new earth, it's all part of the inheritance. There is this future inheritance, Jesus says, and we can't even fully grasp what that means. But there is also, and this is important, there is a present inheritance. A present inheritance. Listen to these words from Jesus in Matthew 19, 29. And everyone who has left house or brother or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive 
a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Don't, don't miss the wording. There is eternal life for those who follow Christ, but there is also blessing here and now. The idea is that whatever we may give up for the Lord, whatever we may give, listen, God blesses us back a hundredfold. Now, he gets to choose how it happens, but there is a return a, a, a blessedness that comes from saying, yes, I surrender to you, Lord, and I will follow you and your way. I love this statement coming from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul is talking about the struggles and realities of the life in which he lives, the ups, the downs. I love these words. Listen, he says, having nothing but possessing everything. I love that, having nothing but possessing everything. Paul, in this, in this, this state of, 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 of difficulty and struggle and adversity, he says, I don't have anything, but I possess everything. I, I want to be like that. I, I, I want that sense of contentment, that, that sense of inheritance. You cannot put a price tag on that. I have nothing, but I possess everything. What a marvelous, marvelous statement of present inheritance. Paul is blessed, and so are we. So those are the words from the text. The question is, how does this impact, affect our lives? So let's, let's spend a few minutes talking about the implications of meekness. Number one, pursue meekness in all of our lives. Pursue meekness in our own lives. I've discovered a couple of things about myself. The first is, I really like meekness. If it's in the second person or third person. But when it's in the first person, I struggle with it. I mean, seriously, I love for you to be meek and I love for you to be meek. I love for her to be meek and for him to be meek. But I struggle when, when I'm called to be meek. I love second and third person meekness, but... First person meekness really causes me to trip up. Here's what else I've discovered is I like to win. I do not like to lose. Now, some things I don't really care about. I mean, you know, if it's small things, board games, although Myra and David Watson, they, they, they don't like to lose at board games. But, but for me, board games, not that big of a thing. But there are some things that are very important to me. Very important to me. And I do not like to lose in those things and I do not like the feeling of being pushed around some would call it short man disease I just don't like the feeling of being pushed around I don't like that those are things I've discovered about myself these are obstacles in my own life that keep me from meekness I've also discovered a couple of other things I think are vital for me, maybe for everybody, I think for everybody, in pursuing meekness in his or her own life. And the first is that meekness and obedience to God go hand in hand. Meekness and obedience to God go hand in hand. Jesus was meek, but he was meek because he was fully submitted to the will of God. I guess the great, the great example of that is the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is facing the cross. It is before him. And he says, Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He submits himself. He goes humble. He goes low in submission to the will of God. And there, that statement takes him to the cross where he will die as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. I, I do not think that meekness, true meekness, is possible apart from obedience. And so if, if I want to be meek, as Jesus calls me to be meek, I've got to submit to God and the ways of God. But also, and I think this is crucially important, growing in meekness is a work of grace. Growing in meekness is a work of grace. Listen to these two passages. One from Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all with un, 
unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Here's the reality, is we don't have the power to conform ourselves to the image of Christ. We do not have the power to uh, transform ourselves into the image of Christ. It has to be a work of grace, a work of God in our lives when we yield to God's work. Someone has said that growing in meekness um, and, and the work of grace can be almost um, sort of aligned or paralleled with how scientists work in the world and engineers. God works in the spiritual world, kind of like engineers or scientists work in the physical world. The, the illustration is that of the Niagara River. The Niagara River is a, is a, is a, is a violent, turbulent river. And, and yet that violent, turbulent power has been transformed, redirected into le electricity that illumines millions of homes and turns the wheels of in industry, right? I mean, that, that's, how, that's how God's work of grace in our lives takes our natural tendencies and redirects them, tames them, using them for his glory. That's, that's meekness. I, I like this statement from Billy Graham. Energy out of control is dangerous. Energy under control is powerful. So the question is, will you allow God's grace to transform you? Will you obey God when you know that you know that you know what he's instructing you to do? Will you allow God's grace to make you meek? Second, praise meekness in others. Praise meekness in others. I, I really think that we are drawn to the, the loud, the, the aggressive, the assertive. And, and the Bible and Jesus would call us to recognize and praise meekness in others. In our Bible study on Wednesday... We were talking about examples of meekness, and someone mentioned Tom Landry, Coach Tom Landry, right? I mean, he was an influential, strong, powerful, but, but, but meekness is probably a really good way to describe his, his posture, his, his personality. Tony J Dungy, another example of that. I, th I think I saw a beautiful example of meekness this past week. It was during the NBA draft. It was televised, and there's one particular player, he was drafted in the first round he was the sixth choice for the Atlanta Hawks and I, I'm gonna mispronounce his name but I'll give it a shot on Yike Akognu I'm sure that's wrong I know that's wrong but anyway anyway when it's announced he is sitting with his family in their living room and you know there's a television camera on him and when it's announced he just sort of folds and melts in this 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 tearful joyful celebration very quiet at that instant when he's it's announced and the first thing he says when the newscaster the sportscaster asks how you're feeling he he said and and I know that athletes say this kind of stuff a lot but he said it in such a way that I, I have no doubt it was it was just genuine he just I, I just want to thank God for this they ask his mother what do you hope happens to your son what are your hope and and I love this she says I hope he remains humble I hope he, he stays as he is. The, the camera panned away from the family back to kind of like the sports desk, if I remember. And they started talking about the things that have sort of helped form this young man's mindset. And one was that his brother, his older brother, had a tragic, I think it was a skateboarding accident, but tragic accident, brain injury, and he died three days after the, uh, the accident. And that, that, that's, that never left the heart and the mind of this young, this young player. And he kept that in mind. And, and when sports writers and so forth would talk to him about, you know, the NBA draft and uh, are you excited about the draft and when it's going to come, this, this, this great basketball player, he's a great basketball player, two-time Mr. California, Mr. Basketball in California, great player. They said he would never, he would never even talk about a potential draft. And the reason was because nothing is ever promised, he said. 
nothing's ever promised. And he was thinking about his brother. Uh, to me, it was just this incredible picture of a strong, powerful, great, but, but in control, meek, humble. I hope that we can recognize, celebrate, and exalt in a righteous way meekness when we see it. Number three, profess our inheritance, not in an arrogant, boastful way to the world, but really what I mean here is just kind of preach to yourself. Proclaim it to yourself. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've got to preach to myself. I've got to remind me myself of, of what I, who I am in Christ and what Christ has done for me. John Stott says this, and I really like this statement. He says, the godless may boast and throw their weight about, yet real possession eludes their grasp. The meek, on the other hand, although they may be deprived and disenfranchised by men, yet because they know what it is to live and reign with Christ, can enjoy and even possess the earth which belongs to Christ. Then on the day of regeneration, there will be a new heaven and a new earth for them to inherit. I, I, can be, I can be meek if I know that truly I have everything that I need. Or, or I know that God will supply me with everything that I need. It, it's when I think that I do not have what I need. It, it's mostly when I think that God will not supply the needs that I have. That's when, I, that's when meekness goes away. That's when I start clawing and pushing people out of the way. That's when I try to climb to the top, even if it means climbing over somebody else. In combat, they tell us that higher ground is the superior position higher ground is the superior position i want to suggest to you that in the spiritual battles that we fight and i also want to say i think that every battle we fight has a spiritual battle behind it or under it the higher ground is when you get lower it's getting low it's getting humble it's meekness that's actually the superior position. Because that's when faith can be manifested. Jim Dennison tells the story of John Harper. He was a Baptist minister who was on the Titanic when it sank. He um, actually gave up his seat on the life raft next to his sister and six-year-old daughter. He gave it up so that he could go back and preach the gospel to the doomed passengers. To put it in the wording of today's text, share the inheritance with those passengers. He actually gave his life jacket to someone, and the person he gave the life jacket to, we know that person did survive. John Harper stayed on the ship continually proclaiming the gospel as it sank until he could no longer speak and he died. A few days before sailing on the Titanic, he wrote a letter to a preacher friend of his who had shown kindness when they were together. And I'm not sure exactly what these words mean, but I just love the way they are written. He writes these words to his minister friend. The warriors are with me here and are doing well so far on the journey. With kindness and love, your loving old pastor, John Harper. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Lord, you love us more than we fully grasp. And the fullest expression of the power of your meekness was when Christ gave himself up for us. Gave him up for an impoverished, spiritually impoverished people. 
to provide grace and mercy for their sins, for our sins. Let us never forget this. Lord, if, if there be anyone here who's never made that decision to, to receive that, to accept that, then may this be the day through penitent faith, just trusting Christ and His sacrifice. And for those of us who have made that decision but continue to struggle in the world in which we live, help us to follow Jesus' footsteps by His grace that we may be meek, that we may be servants to the kingdom. And we pray this in Christ's name. So as you stand, I just want to make an invitation, I, and I do this each week, I, I'll put on my mask and I'll be standing um, to the side of the, the platform. If there's something you'd like to pray about, I, I would love to pray with you. If there's anything, maybe there's a struggle in your family or at work, or maybe maybe this idea of getting pushed around and how to, how do you follow Christ when it feels like you're, man, you're, you, I get it. I may not understand fully your circumstance, but I'd love to pray with you about that or anything. could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grace, the heavens are roaring, the praise of you.
receive this benediction. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. May God pour his grace upon us and may we yield to his grace that we might be used.